During my childhood, I would like to start off saying my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never quite remaining in the same location for a very long period of time, moving all over the country. Now, when I was about eight, we settled in Rhode Island, and we remained there until I went to college in Colorado Springs a bit later. <laughs> Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island. However, there are fragments in the attic of my brain which belongs to the various of homes we lived in when I was much, much younger. Now, most of these memories are rather unclear and pointless, such as chasing another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina, or trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania, and so on and so on. But there's always this one set of memories that remains clear as glass, as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder if these memories were simply lucid dreams produced by a long sickness I experienced in the spring. But in my heart, I know they're real. And I guess that's why I'm here today, to tell you my story of what happened. This disturbing tale I, I just can't get out of my head, and well, I, I figured I needed to get it out somehow. So without further ado, let me begin, because the story is rather long and tedious, I guess. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis in New Vineyard, Maine. Population, 643. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three, that is. I mean, like, there were a number of rooms in there, but I really didn't get to see any of them during the five months of residency there. In some ways, it was just a waste of space. But it being the only house on the market at the time that was at least within an hour's commute of my father's place of work, you'd take what you can get, even at a higher price range. The day after my fifth birthday, attended by my parents alone, due to the fact that we moved way too much for me to actually make friends and hold emotional attachments long distance. Well, after that, I came down with a fever. The doctor said that I had mono, which meant no rough play and more fever for the next three weeks. It was a horrid time to be bedridden, I'll tell you what. We were in the process of packing our bags of Pennsylvania, and most of my things had already been packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother bought me ginger ale and books several times a day, which was, well, pretty cool. I'm like having something to get in me, and ginger ale was one of my favorite drinks. I know, weird kid. And these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom was always looming just around the corner, waiting to rear its ugly head and compound my misery. Now, this is where the entity known as Mr. Widemouth plays a role. I don't exactly know how I met him, and the only thing I really do know is that it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him his name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth, because his mouth was rather large. In fact, just about everything about him was large in comparison to his body. His head, his eyes, and his crooked ears. But his mouth was by far the largest. You kind of look like a Furby, I said as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Widemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. A Furby? Now what's a Furby? I shrugged. You know, it's one of those toys with the, you know, the little robot with big ears. You can pet and feed them, almost like a real pet. Oh. Mr. Widemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They're not the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped in to check on me. Uh, don't worry, don't worry, I lie under your bed, he explained. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid. They won't let us play anymore. We didn't do much those first few days. Mr. Widemouth just looked at my books and was rather fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third or fourth morning after I met him, however, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. Hey, little tyke. I have a new game we can play, he said. We have to wait till after your mother comes in to check on you, because she can't see us play it. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at her usual time, Mr. Weinmouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. Hey, we have to go to the end of this hallway, he said. I objected at first, as my parents had forbade me to leave my room without permission, but Mr. Widemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite to the doorway. 
Mr. Widemouth darted the room and gave the window a firm push, <laughs> flinging it open. He beckoned me to look out to the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from his angle, the drop was a lot farther than two stories due to this incline. I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Widemouth explained. I mean, like, I like to pretend there's a big, soft trampoline below this window, and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce right back up like a feather. I want to see you try. I was a five-year-old with a fever, so the only hint of skepticism that darted through my thoughts was, well, none. And then I looked down and considered the possibilities. It's a rather long drop, I said. But that's all a part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you might as well just bounce on a real trampoline. And that's not all too fun, I think. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through the air, only to bounce back within seconds to the window unseen by the human eye. But the realist in me prevailed. <laughs> Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I, I could get hurt. Mr. White Mouse's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. Ah, <sighs> if you say so. He said, he spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Weinmouth arrived, holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here's some things you'll need to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked at the box. It was full of knives. My parents would kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Weinmouth had brought knives into my room, objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. I'll be spanked and grounded for a year. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle these, though. Come on, I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. No, I can't. I'll get in trouble. Knives aren't safe to throw into the air, you know? Mr. Widemouth frowned deep into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid it under my bed, remaining there for the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. The idea unsettled me. Now, I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night saying he had a real trampoline under the window this time. A big one. One that I couldn't see in the dark. Of course, I always declined and tried to go back to sleep. But Mr. Widemouth persisted and persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early morning encouraging me to jump. It wasn't so fun to play with him anymore. My mother came into my room one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around the outside. She thought that the fresh air would do me some good, especially after being confined in my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of sun on my face. But then, I saw Mr. Widemouth and he was waiting for me. I have something I would like you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because then he said, Oh, don't worry, it's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of the deer trail that ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age, and when they were ready, I took them down this path to a special, special place. You aren't ready, but one day I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into the moving truck, and I would be in a cab, and I would be in the cab of that truck sitting next to my father for the long drive to Pennsylvania. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving, but even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that the creature's intentions were not for my best of benefits, and despite what he said otherwise, for this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at about 4 a.m. I was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunch tomorrow. With the help of an endless supply of coffee and sick packs of energy drinks, he seemed to be the man who would be able to actually make it there in that time span. Early enough for you? My father asked with a hint of sympathy. I nodded and placed my head against the window, hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. 
I felt my father's hand on my shoulder, and I felt oddly comforted by this. Now, son, just understand that this is our last move, I promise. I know it's hard for you as you've been sick and all, but once daddy gets promoted, we can settle down and I'll tell you what, you can make some real friends for once. I opened my eyes as we backed out of the driveway, and I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck turned about onto the road. He gave me a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I, I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as the house was burnt down a few years after my family left. But out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widenoff showed me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind me and scare the living bejeebus out of me. But I felt Mr. Widenoff was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that almost all of the tombstones belonged to very young children, about five years old.